name is Alex Karekis, and I want to welcome you to the Mysteries of Monterey television series, which is produced for Monterey, California's public access television. Now, the purpose of this series is to visit ancient sites that time has long forgotten here in Monterey, California, and elsewhere in the world. Many people are unaware that the first European who set foot on California soil and then later in November of 1542 actually sailed here into Monterey Bay was a Portuguese captain employed by the Spanish known as Juan Cabrillo. And so I think it only appropriate that today we take a visit to a place called the Coa Valley, which is located in northeastern Portugal. The fascinating thing about the Coa Valley is that it contains the world's largest known Upper Paleolithic rock art. And so today's journey will be quite fascinating because we're going to see the symbols left behind by ancient man and visit with the people who maintain this wonderful World Heritage Site.
I'm the Lila Correa. I'm archaeologist of the Archaeological Park and uh, Museum of the Coa Valley. We are in a very special place. We are in the valley that was engraved since the Upper Paleolithic period, so the ancient uh, period with art of the humankind until our days. And we have uh, more than 24 kilometers with on the valley with uh, rocks engraved. Right now we discovered already 1,200 rocks uh, with engravings, but each rock has several, so we have millions of engravings in all the valley in open air since the Upper Paleolithic, so since 30,000 years ago until our days, but most of the figures are uh, from the Upper Paleolithic that have dates like 30,000 years until 10,000 years. But then we have recent prehistory art, Iron Age, a big collection of Iron Age art, also 17th and 18th century art, and engravings of the millers and the shepherds made 50 years ago. So what we have in the Coa Valley, it's uh, in images of what is important in each moment of all this period since 30,000 years until our days. That's why it's the biggest place with Paleolithic art in all the world that we know for now, of course. Shaped horns yeah. that I mentioned oh, earlier yeah, yeah. to my visitors. Yeah. Lyra shaped horns. The muzzle yeah. here, the tail, the hip bone, always very well marked. Yeah. This yeah. is one of the canons yeah. of yeah. Upper Paleolithic rock art. Yeah. The beginning of the back, front leg, belly, and then back leg. Okay? And this is abrasive, mostly abrasive, but also a little bit pecked. You're seeing the difference between abrasion. And a little bit pack with, packed with abrasion. The abrasion makes a very, very clean cut, V-shaped, <laughs> and the packing does, you oh, know. I'm so pleased you called them liar horns. That's the first time I've heard that. Lyra shaped it's, horns. It's perfect. Yes.
Hello, my name is Jorge Sampaio. I'm an archaeologist in Coa Valley since 1995. Um, I excavate uh, many, many sites, many Paleolithic sites to contextualize the rock art. And now um, I uh, try to understand and explain to the people who visit the Coa Valley uh, how these people live it. Uh, with uh, very simple things like the bones, the wood and the stones. Uh, I hope uh, one day you can visit us and uh, learn uh, these simple things with us. But more important is that you come and visit the Coa Valley, the engravings, the museum, the landscape. Take a piece of stone, the oxide piece, and place it inside the bone. And then with an antler from an animal, it could have been a deer, it, it, it could have been a mountain goat, he's going to put it in there, and with a hammer stone, he's going to pulverize it. Mm -hmm. There he goes, he's uh, crushing the stone. And it's a soft stone, and, and as you can see, it, it turns to powder. What we're looking at here is, is how Things were made thousands of years ago. There we go, there's the powder. Okay, so it goes inside a small mixing bowl. There you have it right there. Friends, what we're gonna do here is George is gonna uh, explain to us, he's gonna give us an example of how early man created hand cave paintings. And what he's done is he's shown me these implements. Originally, early man used the bone, a hollowed out bone as a uh, means of projecting the paint. Over here, for expediency, okay, this is the hematite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hematite. That used. Okay, was used to create a liquidy pigment. So there would have been a container that ancient man put his liquefied uh, pigment, here the hematite. He would then take a bone, and let's see what George does over here. Okay. Well, friends, let me show you something. This is the natural aerosol. A bone piece would have been put there, and another one right up against it. Look at that, and there we go. Oh my goodness, look, George is blowing through those two pieces. Okay. Okay. One, two, look three. at that. Oh my goodness. And there we have what we call the negative handprint. I tell you, this is a technique used many, many, many years ago. I've been to many caves and have seen the same thing, and this is really fascinating to actually see the process of how these handprints were made. Thank you, George. <laughs>
and as an archaeologist and I was thinking that the, the map, a large piece of a map of archaeological site, Paleolithic archaeological site, was missing. Uh, at the moment of the discovery of the rock car in the Koa Valley, uh, the site uh, where people were living was completely unknown. And it was a new adventure. And I want to know how people were living, in which place we were living, how we were living, and to build a new history of this, of this region. And what we look first is some uh, contemporaneous site of the rock art, of Paleolithic rock art. And we found some sites between the Gravetian, 30,000 years, 30, years ago, to the Magdalenian, 10,000 years ago. And it was possible to establish a relationship between the occupation site where humans uh, uh, let discard some remains we were using in the common life and to, de to establish a relationship between rock art and other kind of activities people had in this, uh, in this region. My name is Paul Barn. I'm a British archaeologist and I'm sitting here in the Coa Valley in northeast Portugal. And the Coa Valley has become enormously important in archaeology over the past 20 years or so because it's turned out to be the world's greatest treasure house of open-air engravings and, and peckings from the last ice age. We have hundreds of figures, uh, pecked figures, dating from about 25,000 years ago. And we also have hundreds of very finely engraved figures from the end of the Ice Age, somewhere around 13,000 years ago. And for many years, people thought that Ice Age art was restricted to caves, deep caves and rock shelters in, in France and Spain. But now, thanks to sites like the Coa and many others, we've realized that uh, true Ice Age art was actually done out of doors and the stuff in the caves, although it's very interesting, very beautiful, is really a sort of a marginal phenomenon. Um, we've only got something like maybe 400, 410 decorated caves and rock shelters in the whole of Eurasia for about 25, 30,000 years. Whereas it's very clear that they must have been decorating everything out of doors. They were decorating their bodies, their clothing, their tents, and above all, rock surfaces, cliff faces, rocks along rivers, everything. And for many years we thought that this stuff could not possibly have survived since the Ice Age because of the, the terrible climatic conditions, uh, winters and so on. But now we know that given the right microclimate, 
this stuff can survive and we have it particularly in northeast Portugal and other parts of Spain but we also have it in the French Pyrenees, we've got it in Germany now, we've got it in the, uh, the Nile Valley in Egypt. So it's becoming very clear now that this open air art of the Ice Age is a whole new ball game to us. This is normal Ice Age art, the stuff in the caves is not, it's more of a freak survival of a marginal phenomenon.